Good morning, everyone. Such a long pause, you were waiting for something. And then I just said good morning. Bit of an anticlimax, right? It's good to see you all here this morning. We will, in a moment, be in the book of Colossians. Uh, so if you want to find that in Colossians chapter 1, so long. But before that, I have a little treat for you. We've got someone with us here this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Jackie to come up. Um, she's going to share a bit of her story and what God has been doing in her life. And um, just good things, amazing things that she's going to be sharing with you. Now, Jackie, I guess I don't remember exactly when it was. Could it be as far back as about two years ago when we first made contact, when we first got to know you? Is it you were away for a year and it was a bit before that? So, so it's been a little while. It's been a little while and we've been on a journey. Jackie and I meet regularly. We uh, talk about scripture and we... Uh, negotiate life, and we do all sorts of things as we try to seek the Lord's wisdom and grace and um, His guidance and His salvation. And so today, Jackie is going to share a little bit of where God has brought her to and how she has come to this place in her experience, the victories that God has given over some things that have really debilitated her for a good number of years. Perhaps it would be fair to say, Jackie, the majority of your life. And uh, God is bringing her freedom, and so I want you to hear that story before we focus on what, uh, what I have in Scripture here. The interesting thing is at the end of that testimony, uh, Jordan's going to play the guitar, Jackie's going to sing, and you know, singing was one of those things that Jackie has a real passion for, but uh, that along with a number of other things were sort of eroded away, stolen away by a lifestyle of addiction and falling away from Christ, and it's just been amazing to see the journey of recovery. And so today is special for not only because you get to hear the story, but because today is the day when one of those gifts that she thought she had lost is restored to her, and she gets to share it with you in song. So pretty remarkable day for you too, Jackie. Now I've got you in tears before you've started. <laughs> All right. So you come in and, and say a few words here. Isn't he cool? Um, yeah, it's, I just want to pray, Daddy God, it's all about you, I'm yours, it's all about you, Amen. Um, this is just a segment uh, of just like the, this breakthrough that I'm walking in now, um, I don't want to cry the whole time, Oof. Anyway, um, on the 8th of November, a real miracle happened in my heart and in my being, and it was between me and, and my, my daddy God, and um, yeah, I just want to share a bit about what happened then. For, for the few weeks prior, he had been um, talking to me about how that right from my early experiences, um, parts of my heart had frag fragmented. Um, my heart had got broken and some of those fragments had become like my coping mechanisms. They were beliefs and they were thoughts that I thought were my reality. Um, like, um, some of them were. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, some of them were, were like, I, these are just stuff that I, I believed about myself. Bear with me, guys. Um, I mean, this is a, yeah, this is like from infanthood. Um, but I believed that I wasn't wanted, that I was a burden, that I was resented, that I was easily forgotten, that I was easily overlooked and ignored, and that I shouldn't even be here. And, um, and in my struggle with my addiction with alcohol, um, particularly because um, I'd just done 52 weeks, 54 weeks 
and a residential rehab in Paraparan. I, I got back up north um, very end of August, early September. I got back to Whangarei. And, um, and much to my horror, I was even more of a mess than I'd been. <laughs> uh, there'd been, like, God had done some amazing stuff, but um, I still couldn't do life. You know, and um, so, yeah. So he has shown me that these were actually like actual fragments of my heart, and that they had a really strong voice. That when, as soon as I felt insecure, as soon as I felt um, disliked, as soon as I felt um, forgotten, um, as soon as I felt any particular emotional pain, this belief would stand up and, 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 and speak louder than any beliefs I had in God, oh, we have to drink, because that's the only way we're going to cope. We have to make our world as small as possible, because that's the only way we're going to be safe. And I would go on a bender for four or five days. I just wouldn't come out. I would, um, you know, the last seasons I had, um, it was my, my cave was my mum's couch. And... Um, and so I would live on the couch and just drink and sleep. Um, anyway, so he was showing me what that was actually about and what was actually happening in my heart and why. Why am I doing this? I mean, I know better. I know in my being better. Why am I still choosing? Why is that so strong? Why is that still my go-to? And, um, and he was really carefully and gently just bringing me into, like, just acknowledging and realising that they were really, they were beliefs that I had and they were stronger than, than my belief in him. Um, anyway, um, one Wednesday morning on 7th of November, um, I woke up and I was just feeling so vulnerable and so raw. And I sent out a text to my, my people that um, support me and, um, and uh, call me friend. And, um, and I just said, oh, look, I'm, I'm not in a good way and I'm not coping. Um, and I got some beautiful replies back, you know, and it's like everything just hit here, you know. Drug uh, group, support group, and um, right at the very end of that group, one of my, my fellows just turned to me, I didn't even know he was a believer, he just turned to me and he said, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And he just got up and went out. And I was like, <laughs> you know, wow, um, I know who that was from. And I, I went and I sat in my car and I struggled and I battled with me and I battled with the gentleness of, of, of what God was wanting me to understand that this pain wasn't overwhelming and that he had solution, he had resolution, he had healing. And, um, and he just, in that quietness, he also said to me, you know, if you do choose to drink today, you're calling me a liar and that's your testimony. And I chose to drink that night. And the next morning I woke up and I was just horrified. Um, yeah, I was just horrified because I, I, I recognised that that was exactly what I had done, that I had said that he, because he, and his promise, his promise is that he's healing me and that he's making me into this being that's been on his heart and been, he's had these daddy dreams, you know, and things that he's going to do with this life. And, um, and I just repented and I just said, you're not a liar. I'm not going to ever call you a liar again. I don't want to ever call you a liar again. And, um, and there was this, a shift change then. If something happened then. But I just, I just got on my face and I said, but what the heck is my problem? <laughs> why, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep disbelieving you? I don't understand. And he reminded me that he'd been teaching me about the fragments of my heart. And, um, and I said, well, pff, what do I do with them? You know, um, if they're the problem, what do I do with them? And he just said to me, just bring them to me. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge what they've meant 
and the role that they've played um, and that they are valid, they were valid ways of coping and just bring them to me and I, and I did and I'm journaling the whole time and I just, I don't know what to do with these things but I'm giving them to you. I'm just asking that your kindness will bring each and every part to repentance. And within my being, just this huge, like, 360 turnaround, just something really big changed. And I'm, I came into a sense, an essence of being that I've never, ever been before. And um, I feel very much, very much like um, Joseph when he, um, he declared to um, Potiphar's wife, I will not commit this great sin against my God, you know. And what I love about the breakthrough that God's brought um, is, is he made it all about him and me. He made it all about this. It wasn't anything to do with my will or my determination or, you know, my, my, um, my commitment to him um, or falling madly in love with myself or all the stuff that you learn in the world, you know. And it had nothing to do with this thing either. Couldn't suss it all out in my head. It was about his love for me and my love for him, and that that became more important than absolutely anything else. So that's that's just what I wanted to share.
your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Father in heaven, we today rejoice and we celebrate what the work that you've done in Jackie's life. We thank you, Lord, that you have begun the process of restoring to her the things that sin and addiction and unbelief have stolen from her for far too many years. And we pray, Jesus, that your praise will indeed ever be on her lips and upon all of our lips. So you, Lord, are a God who is worthy of praise. You have created and you have redeemed. And we pray for your blessing upon Jackie's life, upon this moment in time and this place of worship. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jackie, for having the courage to share, to be vulnerable, and to tell that story. Colossians chapter 1 is a powerful, powerful chapter. I find myself continually coming back to this chapter. Somehow, wherever I go in Scripture, I land up back here. Because it says so much about who God is, and it says so much about who we are. And as you listen to that story of Jackie's, you would have realized that for so many years, she didn't know who she was. There were other voices telling her what she was, her unworthiness, her, the fact that she is a waste of space. And she chose for many years to listen to those voices rather than to listen to the voice of the God who laid down his life to say, you are not a waste of space, no matter how far you have fallen, no matter what you have gotten up to. No matter what you've experienced at the hand of parents or community or in any other place, even in the church, you are not a waste of space. You are my child. You belong to me. I love you. Colossians chapter 1 has a very powerful way to bring that across. Now, did you know that here in New Zealand, identity theft costs the New Zealand economy every year approximately $209 million? Did you know that? To some larger or lesser extent, about 133,000 Kiwis every year have their identity stolen. Whether it's a credit card or some fraud in their name or some crime that's committed or whatever it is, 133,000 of a very small population, uh, that's, quite a, that's quite a significant number of us. It's, that, it's the kind of thing now which... You can't say happens so sporadically that you don't need to be aware of it or you don't need to take precautions. And if you thought it was bad here in the United States, there are approximately 16.7 million cases of identity theft in 2017 alone. 16.7 million. How, what's the population of New Zealand? Four. Roughly 4 million, right? So that's uh, 4, 8, 12, about 3.5 times our population. <laughs> of people whose identity gets stolen in the United States a year in 2017. And it costs their economy about $17 billion each year. That is a lot of money, isn't it? All because people want to take over your identity and do things in your name that you wouldn't do. They want to do things in your name so they can get away with it, live the high life, whatever it might be, and it's going to come at your cost. Because when you start getting the collection agencies knocking on your door and you say to them, I think somebody stole my identity. They say, whatever, pay up. We have this desire to... 
live the high life, to live the good life, whatever that might mean, at somebody else's expense, right? That's the point of identity theft. So that I don't have to bear the consequences for my own choices, so that I don't have to pay back the debts I incur. It falls on somebody else's shoulders without them even knowing, without them giving their consent. A well-known case of identity theft in the States, a guy by the name of Malcolm Bird, was arrested at his home in 2003 on possession or on charges of cocaine dealing. Turns out a criminal who had been arrested used his name. And the police later on came looking for the real Malcolm Bird to pay the price for the activities of this criminal. A young boy, the age of 12, named Gabriel Jimenez, had his social security number stolen. How old did I say he was? 12. His mother, you see, got a letter from the Revenue Department in the United States saying that your son's taxes have been successfully filed. How old was he? He didn't have any income and he wasn't filing any taxes. And that was beginning, the beginning of a journey to find out that an illegal immigrant had stolen his social security number and his name and was transacting business in his name. A lady by the name of Linda Foley, her identity was stolen by Barry Nacelle. She ran up large credit card debts, destroying Linda's credit rating. And for many years after that, Linda still had trouble trying to get a loan from a bank or a mortgage or a credit card. Because of something that was done in her name by somebody else masquerading as her. Identity theft is a kind of a new concept for us. It's like this new category of crime in this world. But did you know that it is really, although it's a modern trend, it is really a copy of the original sin. The original sin we're told about in Isaiah chapter 14 is where Lucifer decided it was no longer good enough to remain a created being, the first of creation, the highest of all creation. He wanted to be what Jesus was. He wanted to be what God was. And he decided that he was going to take the place of God. And so he launched a coup. You read about it in Revelation chapter 12. It speaks about war in heaven. And the, the outcome of that war, of course, was that Satan and his angels were removed from their place. They then came down to this world and sold us on exactly the same crime. Because when you read Genesis chapter 3, you'll discover that what Satan says to Lu to, uh, what Lucifer says to, to, to Eve in the Garden of Eden is, You will be like God. You can be what God is. He sold her on the same vision, on the same desire, on the same crime that he had committed in heaven. He had been caught out, he had been cast out, but still it was his desire to take the place of God for the human race. And Eve's choice to believe that lie meant that she attempted identity theft just as Satan did, to be like God. She quickly discovered that it was a lie, as identity theft is. It's a lie. You are not that person. You are not them. You can never be God. And ever since then, humanity's problem has been this perpetual confusion of loyalty and of identity. Because when you are loyal to the wrong thing, it shapes the way you see yourself. Those two always go hand in hand. Confusion of loyalty and confusion of identity. Who you are is rooted in your understanding of where you come from. Of who you're connected to. Who is your family? Who is your mother? Who is your father? What is your heritage? Now I'm talking for now on a horizontal level, right? On a merely cultural, on a merely, on a merely humanistic level, right? Where did you grow up? What city are you from? What music is your preference? What sort of a culture or subculture did you identify with? It's all rooted to your past. Your past radically shapes your future. Which is why the gospel is such a powerful narrative, such a powerful story that reorient, reorients your story. Why? Because it goes way back to the beginning and reorients your loyalty. It reminds you that you are not here by mistake. You have not come onto this earth through a result of, a, of chemical concoctions, of natural selection and of chance. You are not here as a scientific experiment, something that just happened to be. 
You are here because you were brought into existence by a heavenly parent, by an intelligent designer, a creator who in his mind's eye saw you from the very beginning, way back in time, thousands of years back. You were brought into existence because you were a child that was wanted. You were a child that has a home, that has a family, that has a place of belonging. Your identity is rooted in the creation event. It's rooted in the creator. It's rooted in the Sabbath experience because the very first day of human life is spent in the presence of the creator on the Sabbath day when he chose not to rush off after the last day of creation on day six and go off with some other building project on some other part of the universe. No, he chose to stick around. That's why the creator rested from his work. The creator who doesn't get tired, who doesn't run out of energy, who is the source of life and of, and of strength and of all those good things. This creator rests in the presence of humanity. His children birthed into existence for the joy of the parent so that the parent can give himself to his children. This is why the Sabbath is so important to us. It's not merely a debate over days and, and what God says in Scripture. It's not merely about who's right, you know, is history and it's changed to Sunday or, or God's word, is it still valid in this day and age for the seventh day? It's not, it's not merely a debate over doctrine. It is because the Sabbath says something about who God is, about his heart for humanity, about your place in his family. He says, come aside on the first full day of existence. Don't go off and work yourselves to death. Come into my presence. Relax and rest. It's a gift of grace to a human race that had not earned rest. Did not deserve rest because they hadn't done anything. And God says, come aside and rest in my presence. Because you exist for me. You exist because I love you. Because I want you in my family. Because you're important to me. Because you're not a mistake. Your identity is rooted in the creation account, in the heart of the creator, in the experience of the Sabbath day. It's why we still rest today, so that we will not get so far away from the creator in all our busyness, in all the rat race of life, in all the pressures of life, in all the ambitions of life, the dreams, the aspirations, just the general mess that we call life. So we will not get too far away before we stop. Take a deep breath. Exhale in the presence of the Savior, the Redeemer. And remember what we were beginning to forget because it was getting crowded out by the craziness of life in the 21st century. We rest to remember where we come from. We rest to be reminded that we matter. We rest because God has said, come into my presence. The very first crime against God was the attempt to take his place, to steal his identity by a created being. It was the very first crime of the human race as well. And as I say, ever since then, we have become forgetful. We have become confused in our loyalty and therefore we do not understand ourselves, our place in the world, our place in the universe, our place before God. And so we muddle through life trying things, experimenting with things that hurt, that kill, that maim, that destroy because we are confused. And we're trying to find something that makes us matter. Some reason for existence. Some pleasure that says this is why we are here. Some grand goal to attain to, to aspire to. And yet every time you reach one of those goals, if you are fortunate to be one of those who do succeed in that, you get there and go, oh, and now it's Monday morning again. And so what? Because none of those things actually define who we are. What you do is not who you are. What you do doesn't define you. Now, that's good news if you acknowledge you're a sinner, by the way. <laughs> you are not the sum total of your addictions. You are not the sum total of your failings. You are not the sum total of your sinful pursuits. You are not the sum total of all that stuff. What you are, confused as you might be, is a child of God. You are and you have a place in His family. 
So I said to you Colossians, I always end up back here in Colossians because when you read verses 15 to 20, it's not saying a single thing about humanity. It is saying everything about God, about Jesus Christ. And it says the following, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him, but he existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. That's where you come from. That's how you were birthed into existence. It is him who sustains your life. He's not just the God of historic creation way back in time. So far back, you can't even count the numbers. No, 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 no. He's not just that. He's the one that today holds everything together. Now, I know, I know in our scientific world, we say the sun comes up because of physics. I know we say that the, that, that, that the planets spin and align and do their thing because of gravitational forces. Because every planet is just the right mass and just the right distance from every other planet for it to keep going indefinitely. And yet, I say to you, in a finely tuned universe like that, that wasn't, you know, that, that, that is supposedly the result of an accidental explosion. I ask you, how does a finely tuned universe continue to exist in such finely tuned balance if it isn't for the God who not only creates, but according to this verse, sustains everything in its balance? Yes, yes, there are natural laws, laws which he himself put in place. And yet we know that this creator God has the ability to undo natural law. Because when you read scripture, that's what he does all the time when it's called a miracle. <laughs> you know, that's what a miracle is, right? It's the undoing of natural law, which the creator has the power to do. The lawgiver is the one who's able to undo the laws that he chooses to temporarily for the blessing of his creation. Then it goes on to say in verse 18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. Did you realize that earlier on in verse 15 in this translation it said supreme over all creation, right? There is no one like him because he is not created. Everything else is. He is supreme over creation. And now it says he is supreme over the church, right? Supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all of his fullness, not partially, not 50%, not 20%, not 99%, God, in all of his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. Translate that into another sentence for me. Jesus is what? God. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That said nothing about you and everything about God. I love this passage. I just keep reading this passage again and again and again. Because in a broken world, in a world of identity theft, there is an enemy who's trying to usurp that place. There is an enemy who's trying to obfuscate this truth, who's trying to make it appear that everything in this world is not under the control of the supreme creator and redeemer. There is an enemy who's trying to make sure that the world is confused about who God is. If he can't stand in the place of God, he's going to make sure that as many as possible turn away from God, confused over his identity, his good intentions for the created world, confused over God's character. Because that's what identity thieves do. They leave the, they leave the real person in the muck. They leave the real person with the bad rap sheet, with the debt to pay. 
That's what's happening in our world today. So I come back to this passage and it reminds me of who God is. It reminds me that what goes on in this world is not necessarily a reflection of God. Not necessarily a reflection of His intentions. Not necessarily a reflection of His heart. Because there is an enemy who's tried to steal His identity. Okay, now the part that comes to us. The therefore. If God is all of this, then therefore. Verse 21. This includes you who once were far away from God. You were His enemies. Separated him from, from Him by your evil thoughts and actions. Translate that phrase into sin. Yet now, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. Remember the Sabbath idea? Created and gifted with this, with this time, this gifted with this grace. Before we had done anything, before we needed rest. Gifted with the presence of God. Gifted with rest. In the presence of the Creator God, which we forfeited through our, through our confusion of loyalty, our confusion of identity. But now through Christ, this gift has been restored to us. We have been brought back into His presence, it says. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. Now let me remind you, he's writing this to the believers at Colossian, at Colossae, at the city He's writing this to a church which was not perfect, a church which was not sinless, a church which was not yet triumphant. It was still the church militant at war in this world, a church which was at war with influences outside of itself, trying to persecute Christianity out of existence, and a church which was at war with the principle of sin in their own beings. They themselves were sinners. And he says to them, he says to them, the supreme over all of creation, the supreme over all who rise from the dead or over the church, this being. This Jesus Christ, the one in whom the fullness of God resides, this one who laid down his life, who in his physical body paid the price, the penalty for sin, the penalty that you and I incurred when we try to steal his identity, he ended up having to pay that debt. The penalty that was incurred when his number one of created beings in heaven tried to steal his identity, that, 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 that price that needed to be paid, he paid that price on the cross. Because it's always the victim of identity theft that's left with the bill to pay. And he paid the price in full on the cross. So that you and I, the ones who were disloyal, the ones who bought the lie that we could be God as if, could be reconciled to the one from whom we try to take it. Now, I don't know. If somebody stole my identity, I, I've got better plans for them than to be my friend. But he paid the debt so that you wouldn't. So that you could be reconciled. And now, in your brokenness, in the mess that you call life, in the struggle with your spouse and with your children, with your work colleagues... The mess we call relationships. The stuff you don't like about yourself when you get up in the morning and you see that face again in the mirror. The, 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 the voices of this world, the influences of culture, the whatever it is that speak into your life. In all the confusion of that mess that we call human existence, in your imperfection and your sinfulness. And right now, in that state, before you have fully overcome... The moment you receive this fundamental truth about who God is, about what God has done in history, both through creation and redemption, when you receive that truth, it reorients your life such that you now, in that current mess, stand blameless and faultless and sinless before Him. Your struggle throughout life will be whether you're going to believe that or whether you're going to believe the mess that you call your life. How can I be like that when I'm like this? How can this be true when I still struggle like that? How can this be true 
When this still happens, you will never become this by trying to be this. You will become this as you accept what He has done in Christ. As you begin to believe this, you will begin to live this. As long as you still believe the old, you'll find yourself spinning in circles because you're not looking up from the old. Jordan preached a sermon a little while ago where he told you about his experience with his brother learning to drive. And since then, I put it to the test and found it's quite true. Where you look on the road is where you inevitably go. If you look into the lights of the oncoming vehicle at night, instead of avoiding them, you gravitate towards them. I don't recommend you try it. The point is this, that until you start believing and seeing what Christ has done, that's something new that is taking place, you will not get out of the old. It's not about wishful thinking. It's not about if I just think happy thoughts, I will be happy. It's not like that at all. This is a historical reality. It's based in the fact of who God is and what God has done. This is not the power of positive thinking about yourself. No, it's believing a truth about who God is and what He has done for you and is doing in you. In other words, it's believing a truth, not just a dream that I hope will come to fruition. So let me read that again. Your identity, your identity is that you have been brought into His own presence. You are holy and you are blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. And then he says in verse 23, But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. What's the implication if he's having to say that? The implication is found explicitly highlighted in chapter 2, verse 8, where he says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies, high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ, he always comes back to who God is. He always comes back to that. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. And when you go back just a few pages, one page in my Bible to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, We are citizens of heaven. Here's a question for you. As a citizen of New Zealand, is it a privilege to be in this country or a right? As a citizen. It's a right. No one can throw you out. We can put you in jail, but we can't throw you out. If I am a foreigner on a tourist visa, is it my right or my privilege? And if I break your laws, what happens? Yeah. Or maybe you'll give me a residency in jail, as has happened lately, right? <laughs> But you hear what I'm saying, right? If you are a tourist, it means you don't belong. This is not your home. That is not the language of Scripture. You are a what? A citizen of heaven. This is your identity. You have a... Can we use that? I almost don't want to say it because I don't feel worthy of it. I have a right to heaven. Why? Why? Because my debt was paid. Because Jesus Christ took my place on the cross. I am not a visitor, not a tourist, but a citizen of heaven. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Brothers and sisters, the message is very simple. You heard it from Jackie this morning in her experience. The victory begins when you understand who God is and how that changes your identity. 
as you begin to believe this new truth based in the historic acts of creation, in the historic acts of redemption, when you begin to believe who God is and what you mean to Him, when you understand creation and the Sabbath and what that means for your belonging to Him, when you understand that the cross is the reconciling of the, of the, of the thief with the true person, of God, when you understand that He has done everything and paid the price for your redemption, you belong to Him. You have a right to heaven. You are not a visitor, you are a citizen of heaven. When you begin to believe that, the patterns of your life begin to change. Because everything you do, if you trace it back carefully enough, will come back to what, who you believe you are, what you think your rights and entitlements are. In this life. And unfortunately, because of sin, our loyalty has become confused, which has resulted in our identities becoming confused. Our rights and our entitlements are all messed up in our head. And so we go to war over carnal things, thinking that this world is what it's about. My position, my place, my pride, my this, my that, my you're stepping on my stones, you're in my space, you're in my territory. We don't live for this world. We don't live for this life. You are citizens of heaven. Your identity is bound up in who God is and what He has done for you. In order to live a new life, you need a new vision. And that vision is found in God and in what He has done. So let's sing a song as we close. It's called, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine. And I think you can understand, and as you, from the title, and you'll understand as you sing these words, well known song, that this is what we're singing about our relational restoration to God, being brought back into His family, being restored to His favor, becoming citizens entitled to the gift of life and of heaven.